Happy Friday, everyone, and welcome to WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week and to sharing some practical security tips along the way. I'm Corey Knockrinder, your host and security nerd, and this is the episode for the week starting July 15th, 2013. After skipping last week's episode due to a vacation, I'm returning with a bunch of security stories, starting with the update to the Android master key vulnerability. If you remember from the last episode, I talked about a security group called Blue Box uh, disclosing a flaw that affected Android uh, APK files, or the installer files you, you use to install software on your Android phone. Essentially, they found a way to manipulate those files without affecting the digital key, meaning that attackers could make a true Trojan version of an application that still looked legitimate. Well, I have a few updates to the story. The first update is a few days after Blue Box's disclosure, a Chinese group called the Android Security Squad released another very similar vulnerability. It was slightly technically different, and I won't go into much details about it, but the end result or the impact was you could also use this flaw to uh, modify an Android APK file without affecting its digital signature so that it still seems legitimate. So now there's two flaws that allow you to modify files. Now the good news is I I mentioned last week that Google hadn't patched. The truth is, Google has actually patched both these flaws in their version of Android OS. Now the problem is, many OEM vendors, the people that load Android to phones or tablets or, or smart uh, devices have not necessarily pushed this Google patch to their devices yet. So even though there is a patch for this available from Google's own servers, many OEM providers are still going to be slow to patch. The final update I want to talk about is a, a group of researchers from an educational institute also released an application, a beta application called ReKey. And this application will help you patch this vulnerability. If you have a rooted Android phone, you can run this application and it should patch the vulnerability as well as it will warn you if any particular applications are trying to leverage this flaw against you. Now, of course, I'm not sure if I should recommend ReKey or not. ReKey is not a Google-approved first-party patch. It is a third-party attempt to fix this flaw. And furthermore, it only works if you've rooted your phone, if you've purposely uh, taken control of your phone beyond what your vendor may allow. Nonetheless, it's good to see there's options out there for Android users. So if you're an Android user, keep track of your vendor's uh, Android updates to be sure to get the patch when it comes out. And if you really are kind of a savvy technical user who's not afraid of rooting, you might consider trying to use Reiki. Are you a Tumblr user? Do you have an iOS device? Then you need to know about this vulnerability. During the week, Tumblr released an email warning its users that their iOS or iPhone and iPad Tumblr app suffered from a vulnerability. Essentially, the flaw was that they transmit passwords in clear text. That means if you connect to a public Wi-Fi hotspot and you use the Tumblr app on your iPhone, attackers may be able to intercept or sniff your password which could be really bad. The good news is Tumblr has released an updated iOS app, so if you use the iOS version of Tumblr, you should definitely go get that update now. Furthermore, if you've been using Tumblr on open uh, Wi-Fi hotspots, it's probably a good idea to change your password. Now the truth is, I doubt real-world attackers really have been sniffing for Tumblr passwords. Nonetheless, the best advice is still uh, change your password. It's better to be safe than sorry. Another interesting topic from this week is two new interesting variants of Mac malware. The first is a new piece of malware being dubbed JannyCab A, and it's a malware that uses this right-to-left character encoding trick. Now this is a trick that Windows malware has actually been using for, for years. Basically, Unicode, uh, one of the languages used to encode characters on the internet, has a particular character that allows you to, to tell computers to translate characters from right to left. This is for special languages like Japanese or Hebrew or, or any sort of language where you read from right to left rather than left from right. 
In any case, for a while, malware authors have been leveraging this right-to-left character to help socially engineer people to open files they shouldn't. For instance, if you have an .exe file, but you want it to look like some other file, like a JPEG file, you can actually uh, use this right-to-left trick to get the extensions to show in the wrong order. And that's just what this new Mac malware did. So this is the first Mac malware I know that uses this particular trick. And it actually comes as a file that is a .app or an application file. It's really an executable application. But they use the right to left uh, character trick to make it look like a PDF file. Now, if you get this file via email or the web or whatever, and you open it, it's actually running an application in the background, but it will open up a legitimate looking PDF file, so it may still trick you into thinking it's a real PDF. Uh, nonetheless, if you get infected with it, it's going to start taking screenshots of your system, start keylogging that, and start sending everything back to a command and control channel, which will also keep track if there's new commands the attacker might want to execute. So it's interesting to see that Mac malware, again, is becoming more mature and starting to leverage the more uh, interesting tricks that Windows malware has, has leveraged for a long time. Another interesting Mac malware variant is some new Mac ransomware. Remember, ransomware is any sort of malware that tries to scare you into paying them money for whatever reason. Now, this is actually very simple malware. This is malware you might encounter if you visit a website, and the, the website's going to execute some very basic JavaScript that will cause a pop-up to show up on your window, and it will show uh, like it's some sort of FPI warning saying they found some illicit uh, pornography on your machine and that you have to pay a very, very big fine or you're going to get uh, arrested or something from the FBI. And the way this JavaScript works, it's, it's going to put Safari into a loop which will always show this pop-up over and over, making you think that you might have to pay a fine or the FBI will be after you. Now, the good news is this is very unsophisticated malware. It really is just a pop-up. And if you actually reset your Safari settings, you can get rid of the pop-up. So the moral of the story is Mac malware continues to evolve and get better and better. If you're a Macintosh user, you need the same types of security controls that Windows uh, users have been using for a long time, whether it's host-based antivirus or gateway security controls like the device agnostic gateway antivirus that WatchGuard offers on our devices. So make sure to secure your Macs. Next up, I want to quickly cover a very simple vulnerability affecting Google Glass. You've probably heard of Google Glass. These are the, the Android glasses that see everything you see and allow you to interact with a smart computer or a smart device in new ways. There's a lot of controversy over the privacy issues of Google Glass, which security people like me have covered for a long time. In any case, a mobile security company called Lookout talked about a new flaw they found in Google Glass. Basically, Google Glass has some features that allow it to automatically process QR codes. These are uh, the, the modern day barcodes you see all over the place on posters, on airline tickets you use on smartphones and things like that. In any case, because there's no easy user interface, typing interface in Google Glass, they use these QR codes for a lot of things, such as setting up access to a Wi-Fi hotspot. But the vulnerability was Google Glass would automatically try to process these QR codes whenever it saw them. So if an attacker placed a QR code on a, a poster that you might look at, this QR code could force your Google Glass device to connect to a new Wi-Fi network, one you didn't intend to really connect to. And if that happens, of course, the attacker in control of the Wi-Fi network can start sniffing all your communications, which is bad. Now, the good news is Google has kind of fixed this vulnerability. They still can use QR codes for Wi-Fi setup, but they no longer do it at any time. They only will actually look for a, a, a Wi-Fi QR code if you're trying to configure your Wi-Fi network. So they have fixed this. Nonetheless, it shows some of the potential new ways you can exploit new devices like Google Glass. And as an aside, I have an interview that showed up in PC Magazine talking about other vulnerabilities with Google Glass. I'll be sure to link to it in the reference section of this video. In my opinion, one of the most interesting stories this week was a new fem 2 cell hack. If you haven't heard of a fem to cell device, these are small router-like devices that act as mini cell phone towers. 
Basically, if at your house you don't get good cell phone reception, whether it's from Verizon or AT&T or, or whatever, you might be able to buy this fem to cell device, which you would plug into your wired internet connection. And it would act as like a mini cell phone tower in your house that would then translate communications over your internet connection and kind of be that last hop for places that have bad cell phone reception. In any case, a couple of researchers found some vulnerabilities in the fem to cell device that Verizon sells to its customers for around $150 to $250. They haven't released a lot of technical details about the vulnerability. They plan to do so at some upcoming security conferences. But basically, they were able to take advantage of the device so that they could start sniffing all the network traffic that's happening over these cellular wireless connections. And they talked about how once you can do this, it's pretty easy to convert these devices into portable devices. If you attach them to battery packs, you maybe use uh, special antenna tricks to extend their range, and you maybe hide all this into a backpack, what you can do is walk around a city, everyone that is in the same uh, cellular provider as that particular device, say it's Verizon, when they pass by you, they're probably going to associate to your fem to sell a cellular tower. And then all their communication will be going through this hack device. And in their uh, demonstration, which I'm showing in this video here, they were able to do things like sniff text messages, intercept phone calls, and many other things. So it's an interesting new hack showing how you can take advantage of flaws in the device. Now the good news is Verizon has actually already patched these vulnerabilities that these researchers found. So if you get the latest software, you should be protected from uh, at least these first vulnerabilities. But the researchers in question warned that there's going to be many other different vulnerabilities affecting these fem to cell devices. So if you buy them, you might want to consider that and be very careful. So let me end with the last story, which is stenography malware. More specifically, how to hide a web application backdoor in a JPEG image. During the week, researchers from Securi uh, released details about a very interesting new way to hide a, a web server backdoor. If you've ever paid attention to web application attacks or web server attacks, often once a bad guy gains elevated access to your web server, he's going to start to hide assets on your web server, like hidden PHP scripts or maybe CGI scripts, so that he can retain that backdoor access and continue to access your web server to do bad things. Now, of course, once administrators find these backdoors and delete them and maybe upgrade the software that caused the vulnerability in the first place, uh, the bad guy loses his access. But Securi found a new and very interesting way to hide a backdoor in a JPEG image. I'm not going to go into all the technical details, but long story short, images sometimes have EXIF data. This is actually just metadata you can put in images. Usually it's stuff like uh, when the picture was taken, uh, what type of photogra photography settings, uh, maybe geolocation, stuff like that. These attackers use the, the fields in the EXIF data to basically hide some more script. And then they could place uh, some special, very uh, benign looking script on your web page that would refer to this image's EXIF data to reload a backdoor, thus giving a bad guy access. So even if you uh, found maybe his evil PHP files on your website and got rid of them and thought you had cleaned up the website, there might be this little bit of benign looking code that would reload a backdoor based on some hidden uh, uh, code with in a JPEG image. And the sad thing is these images still work as normal images. Since this is just EXIF data, it doesn't affect the image itself. And in the uh, real world cases Secunia actually researched, these bad guys would actually use real images that belonged on your website, download them, inject this malicious code into EXIF data, and re-upload them. So they would use your own images to actually backdoor your website. So this is a very interesting new way to retain backdoors on websites. And this, by the way, is called stenography. Stenography is kind of hiding hidden messages and other things. We've often used stenography to maybe hide hidden text messages in image files, but hiding code like this and then using it to spawn a backdoor is very, very interesting and something web administrators out there should keep track of. Now, how you can protect yourself from this? Uh, one of the things 
things is actually putting checksums on files. There's many solutions and products out there that will actually uh, put a checksum on your file and then validate it. So if any change happens to a file like your JPEG image, they can immediately tell you. So if you're a web administrator, you might consider using that on your web server. Well, that's it for this week's episode. I hope you found it interesting. Now, it was a busy week. There's a lot of stories I didn't cover, and there's some I missed from last week due to my vacation. So be sure to check out the reference section in the WatchGuard Security Center post for a lot of extra stories as well. And I recommend you always follow the WatchGuard Security Center as we post regular security advisories and news onto that particular blog. While you're at it, also follow me on Twitter. I'm at SecAdept, or you can follow my company at WatchGuardTech. As always, thank you for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.